hello and hi, 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 Beatle fans. Welcome to another edition of Things We Said Today. This is a talk show podcast on the Beatles in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Fab Four. It could be about their music, their history, their childhood, what's going on today. <laughs> really, anything is up for grabs on this show. And I am Ken Michaels. You might know me for a couple of other Beatle programs that I'm a part of, a syndicated Beatle show heard on over 40 stations right now called Every Little Thing. Also, another talk show podcast, which is all on the solo Beatles called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And I'm joined by my regulars here on the program. First of all, a man who's been a part of New York radio for almost 40 years now at uh, New York's WFUV where he's also their Beatle guy, does a lot of specials on the Beatles, lots of wonderful interviews with people in the rock field, and that's our own Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. How are you, Ken? Hi, Alan. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, listening to uh, the show today. And our other co-host, you know him for a couple of Beatle books that he's written, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and also Got That Something, how I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And for many years, he worked at the New York Times, manning the desk at the classical department. And anything that had to be written on the Beatles would be written by him. For many years, he's written for Beatle Fan Magazine. He also is a freelance writer for uh, the Wall Street Journal and other publications. And that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken and Darren and everyone out there. On the show today, we're going to have an interesting conversation that pertains to the Beatles catalog and their early music versus their later music. And the popularity today, and actually for several decades, of both. I'll explain that more after we um, tell you all what's happening in the latest of Beatle news. And um, as you would imagine, early in the year... There's a lot less news than in the rest of the year, but we'll get to what we do have. And first of all, we'll start off with a tidbit of news concerning the forthcoming Plastic on All Band box set. The website PlasticOnAllBand.com says that an announcement will be made on March the 4th. So originally it was going to be in January or early 2021. And uh, now they're saying that the announcement will be on March 4th. So we will know what the release date will be then. They're not saying it'll be coming out March 4th, just that we'll know on March the 4th. I just have a sneaking suspicion because we do have a Plastic Metal Band box set coming out and All Things Must Pass box set coming out and also a Let It Be box set coming out. They'll probably be spread out probably a couple of months apart. So it's just my own personal opinion and I don't have any inside information here. I would think March or April, Plastic on Oban, May and June, all things must pass. And since we do know that the film for Get Back is supposed to be, hopefully in theaters, the very end of August, the Let It Be box should be a, a, about then. Would you guys agree with me? Yeah, that's that's yeah. probably true. And, and somewhere in there, too, there's the next uh, McCartney archival ones. Well, I have a feeling that probably won't be while this is being released, probably towards the end of the year, I would think. Just my hunch. It's too much material all at once. Too many box sets. (laughs) That's true. Too much necessary cash. (laughs) In a pandemic where nothing's open. (laughs) Yeah. See, Ringo makes it easier for all of us. He just puts out an EP. (laughs) You know? Yeah. He sympathizes with all of us. Ringo's catalog is due an overhaul in a box set, so there'll be, an, <laughs> that there'll be another thing to buy. <laughs> that is true. Uh, in other news, Paul McCartney's latest album, McCartney 3, well, it's chart activity. It debuted at number two, sunk to 37, dropped to 90, went all the way down to number 200, and now is off the charts. So kind of like what I said about Egypt Station, and new albums by veteran artists today. They have a high debut at the very beginning, and their chart life tends to be around four weeks, which is exactly what happened with McCartney 3. Also, this is very interesting. Rolling Stone reports 
that Yoko Ono and Janie Hendrix, the stepsister of Jimi Hendrix, are among those starting a new music channel called the Coda Collection, which will be streamed exclusively through Amazon Prime Video. The channel was named after the new multimedia company co-founded with CEO Jim Spinello, also with director-producer John McDermott and veteran entertainment lawyer Jonas Erbsman. Sony Music Entertainment is an equity partner, and the channel will launch on February the 18th, which happens to be Yoko's 88th birthday. Yoko was quoted on the new venture. She said, John was always on the cutting edge of music and culture. The Coda Collection will be a new way for fans to connect on a deeper level. The article from Rolling Stone goes on to say that the channel will feature rare concerts and new documentaries, as well as premiere films, alongside other music programming. During the channel's launch, they will premiere new films like Music Money Madness, Jimi Hendrix in Maui. Also, The Rolling Stones on the Air, Johnny Cash at San Quentin, and Miranda Lambert, Revolution Live by Candlelight. Also, newly filmed exclusive performances will debut, including sets from Jane's Addiction and Stone Temple Pilots. Amazon Prime members will have access at the launch to 150 titles for $4.99 a month with new content updated regularly. Very interesting there. Yoko keeping active and probably just uh, helping to finance it, I would guess. Yeah, it did. Just, it was it was nice to see her name attached to something new, and you, you know, and just the thought. All right, she's hopefully doing okay, and you know, it was able to sign off on uh, something pretty interesting and well new. <laughs> yeah, I'm just glad that she's active doing anything. So that's a good sign right there. Be interesting if any John Lennon material surfaces on this channel. Have to wait and see. And uh, also, according to one of my major news sources, and that's our own Darren DeVivo. Thank you, Darren. <laughs> uh, Dark Horse Records will be releasing a new compilation of Joe Strummer's music from his solo years, and it's called Assembly. This is a 16-track compilation which features carefully curated singles, fan favorites, archival rarities, and more. It'll be available on a Gatefold 2LP vinyl version, also on CD, and digitally for streaming and download. It is due out March the 26th, and it's now available for pre-order. I love these phrases, these descriptions, caref carefully curated. <laughs> like what? What did they just like put song titles on the wall and throw darts at them and whatever <laughs> they hit, that goes on the album? Of course it was carefully curated. <laughs> you would hope it was. Yeah, right? You know. It's we like grabbed seeing, any of the first things we could think of and put them on the album. If you're not happy with it, of course it's carefully curated. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the first release from the re, uh, revitalized Dark Horse label uh, that's coming out on a physical format, I think. I think it, you're right, because everything else, I, I believe, has just been digital. Been digital. So this is going to be the first thing that you can uh, get on CD or LP from dark horse now that the label's been started up again mm. um, and i do wonder how joe strummer's catalog got to be a part of dark horse yeah, and i'm i'm, I'm yeah. guessing probably through danny i would assume so yeah that's a, a good point but uh, i i don't know but uh, there's some great stuff that he did with the mescaleros so uh joe strummer that is uh so this should be a good collection mm. okay and in now, the world, I'm... it was carefully curated so i mean what more <laughs> It's kind of like advertising food and you say it's fresh, you know, like, <laughs> what do you expect it to be? You know, I think, well, isn't McDonald's that takes pride in the fact that their eggs are freshly cracked? I mean, no, you cracked <laughs> them three weeks ago and you <laughs> left them on the side. Of course they're fresh. <laughs> anyway, enough on that. Mm. All right. Last show, I mentioned that legendary record producer Richard Perry has a new book coming out on Kindle called Cloud Nine Memoirs of a Record Producer. Now it's been confirmed as a soft cover book due out February the 16th. For Beatle fans, Perry produced Ringo's two most successful albums back to back, Ringo and Goodnight Vienna. Thanks to John Bazzini of the Facebook page, The Beatles in Print, Together and Solo for that. Some new cover versions of solo Beatle material. Peter Frampton 
We'll have a new CD coming out in April in which we'll be covering George's song, Isn't It a Pity? The Black Crows have just released a cover of John's song, Jealous Guy. But this is not a new recording from them. It's an outtake of sessions from their first album, which is now getting a deluxe box set treatment. Thanks to Mike Nari, one of our listeners, for this information. Also, Cheap Trick has a new album coming out in which they covered John's song, Give Me Some Truth. But that recording has actually been available for some time now as a download and uh, also for a record store day release in 2019. But they're including it on their new album, which is called In Another World, due out April the 9th. Okay, we have a few major passings to talk about. First of all, the death of legendary broadcaster Larry King, who is best known for interviewing hundreds, probably thousands, (laughs) of celebrities on his TV programs, mainly on CNN. Paul was interviewed with then-wife Heather Mills for one interview. Larry was there at the one-year anniversary for the Beatles' love show in Las Vegas, interviewing Paul, Ringo, Yoko, and Olivia. Larry also interviewed Julian in 2011, and he died at the age of 87. So I'm told, yet but another victim of COVID-19. Anyone want to comment on Larry King? I have to say, Uh, just just in terms of interview technique, um, I always thought it was odd that he would do something like I remember a, a an interview with Yoko where he said so you know what was it like seeing your husband shot down right in front of you and I, I don't know I, I just I just thought that was kind of a strange way to phrase yeah, the question I mean, to someone hmm. who had been through that experience but hey that's me he always seemed to need to when he was interviewing a a contemporary musician or something like, I think he interviewed Eric Clapton once and was constantly going back and referring to uh, interviews and people that he knew from 50 years before. And it was like, <laughs> you know, kind of kind of silly. That's the thing about Larry King. And, and um, you know, I think for a mainstream audience, he was fine as an interviewer. He asked a lot of very general questions that the average person wouldn't know he would be the type of person who, if Paul brought up yesterday in an interview, he'd be shocked. You know, he'd think it was the greatest revelation. But um, sometimes if you're someone who's a more hardcore fan of a certain person, a contemporary person, it could be embarrassing sometimes, the questions that Larry would ask. And even during the, um, the interview at the love anniversary, I think he confused Ringo with George. Right. If you remember, yeah. I mean, my goodness, <laughs> that's just the thing. He was comfortable with people from his era. He could do great interviews with those people. But Maybe. when it came to more contemporary people, you know, he really struggled. And he prided himself in not being prepared for his interviews because he felt that being overly prepared would make the interview suffer because you'd probably try to get too much in. He probably cared more about listening to what the person he's interviewing had to say. So, you know, in the course of all this, he he did a lot of really strong interviews. But there were those moments when you could cringe. And um, but still, he is a broadcast legend. And, um, you know, sorry to see him go. Yeah, that's a that's a very good, uh, I think, um, approach. But you better be good at your craft if Mm. you're not to be prepared. There have been times when I've done interviews where I want to leave, you know, space. I want to leave. I don't want to be totally scripted. That actually has distracted me sometimes more than being unprepared. But, you know, um, you better be able to fly by the seat of your pants Mm -hmm. if that's the case. Right. There have been times where 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 he's fallen, you know, he fell on his face. I mean, there's nothing, you know, that that famous interview he did with, um, I mean, a couple of them, uh, um, a Marlon Brando interview he did. It was like a little cringe worthy and Jerry, um, Jerry Seinfeld. Mm. So, yeah. Well, still, you know, the one thing I, I would like to say about Larry King is that I kind of miss the times. He was really good when someone in the entertainment field passed away and he would do a tribute show. And you would get people on the show that knew that person. And sometimes they would just call in on phone 
But I miss those days when that would happen. You don't have that now. No, great point. You know, I always remember when certain people who are important to me, I want to see how they're covered when they die. And when someone like George Martin passed away, I saw very little coverage of it on television and on right. the all news channels. And it would be on the crawler instead. I mean, somebody like him deserved to have a lot of time devoted to his passing. And right. Larry King would be good at bringing people on board, especially if they're people that he grew up with, whether they're actors or singers. But, you know, I miss those times and I look forward to those specials, even for people that I wasn't a big fan of. You know, I like to hear what right. other people who knew the entertainer had to say. And I right. miss shows like that. I really do. Anyway, another passing here of notes, and that's of animator Ron Campbell. Australian born, his career began by animating uh, commercials for television there. When Al Brodax brought his cartoons Beetle Bailey and Crazy Cat there for production, Campbell was asked to work on the shows, and that led to his working on the animated Beetle cartoons for King Features, where it debuted in September of 1965 and ran for four years. Ron was also hired by Bill Hanna of Hanna-Barbera, and he relocated to Hollywood, where he worked on shows like Scooby-Doo, Rugrats, Rocket Power, and Ed, Ed, and Eddie, and the Smurfs. Al Brodax contacted Campbell again in 1968 from London when he was working on the Beatles film Yellow Submarine, and he asked Campbell to animate many of the connecting sequences of the movie, and he ended up animating about 12 minutes of the film. Ron Campbell was 81. And also, there's the passing of Hilton Valentine, who was a founding member of The Animals. It was his guitar playing that you heard at the beginning and throughout their big hit of The House of the Rising Sun. Part of the British invasion right there. Hilton lived in Wallingford, Connecticut, not too far from me. And he was 77 years old. Uh, before we end our news... Just want to remind everybody of some releases coming out. February 26th, we will have the three-disc set called Dylan 1970, which has outtakes from the sessions from his albums New Morning and Self-Portrait. And it includes a rehearsal from May 1st of 1970 between Dylan and George Harrison. And like I mentioned before, Ringo's new uh, five-song EP called Zoom In is due out on March the 19th. All right. And we'll be out on cassette. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's coming out on CD and digitally and, and no, vinyl, I believe. Yeah, okay. It is going to be on cassette. I've already ordered mine. Okay. Well, you're getting into cassettes now or just as a collector's item? No, well, they, they collector's items. They look cute on the shelf. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Buying no stuff that looks listen. cute. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, no, I'm sticking by that. It's cute. They're cute. Okay. Cassettes are cute. Okay. All right. So our main topic for our show this time has to do with the Beatles' early music versus their later music. Now, sometime a while ago, before I started this podcast show with Steve Marinucci, I was at another podcast show called Fab Forum, and I was in that show for two years. And one of the shows that we did was an idea that I came up with, and it was something that had been bothering me for quite some time. Some of you might be aware that I'm very much a chart buff, and I follow the charts fairly religiously, the singles charts and the album charts. And uh, throughout the 70s on up, I'd always be rooting for Beatles and solo Beatles releases, singles and albums to see how well they're doing on the charts and my other favorite artists as well. And I've noticed that for quite some time now, and I might want to say ever since Beatles CDs came out in 1987, that whenever there's a resurgence in the Beatles, which usually happens uh, whenever there's a new release, whether it's the Beatles Anthology or the Beatles One or the Beatles Love or the archival box sets, that thankfully other Beatles albums reappear on the album charts. However, what I've noticed is 
that it's always their later albums. It's always Sgt. Pepper, The White Album, and Abbey Road. And you will never find anything that's pre-1967 on the album charts. And I'm talking about Billboard. And by the way, these days, you can just go online to billboard.com and look at the album charts every single week, and it doesn't cost you anything. So I'm always keeping track of whether or not the Beatles are on the charts. Right now, the Beatles 1 is on the, the top 200, as is Abbey Road. But you will never find anything before Sgt. Pepper that's on the charts. The only representation of early Beatles music on the charts is what's on the Beatles 1. And I'm kind of baffled by this, to tell you the truth, because as I'm sure the three of us are, we, we treasure this catalog. And part of the joy in experiencing the Beatles is noticing their evolution and the progress they made from album to album. And certainly ever since the CDs came out in 1987, and a lot of Americans suddenly had to get used to the British albums, I've noticed that there's a lot more respect given to an album like Revolver, which in some surveys is listed as their best album. It goes back and forth. We all know that. Sometimes you'll still see Sgt. Pepper listed as their best album, depending upon which survey you look up, Mojo, Rolling Stone, whatever. So Revolver's gotten so much more respect, I feel, ever since the CDs came out. Rubber Soul, I think, has gotten much more respect. But those albums never appear on the charts anymore, ever. (laughs) And I'm sure that if the day does come, and we don't have any inside information about this, but I do believe that after the Let It Be box set comes out, hopefully Capital and Universal will put out archival releases of those albums. And when that happens, yeah, they'll appear on the charts and hopefully do well, like Sgt. Pepper, The White Album, and Abbey Road have done so far. But for all this time, you'll never find those early albums through Revolver anywhere on the charts. It's also kind of interesting when we talk about the later stuff. Nobody brings up Magical Mystery Tour. (laughs) Nobody's saying, when is there going to be a Magical Mystery Tour box set or, you know, and Yellow Submarine has to be represented too. But I did this show when I was on Fab Forum, and I figured it's a great topic to bring up again with two other people to get their perspective on this. And I do recall that I got several emails on this topic, and I won't tell you what the lister said till later on, because I don't want to influence what my two co-hosts have to say. But I'm curious to know why you think this is. Why is there not the love for the early Beatles music through Revolver as there is for their later stuff? And right now, you don't know this, but Darren is jumping up and down, raising his hand. He wants to be the first person to answer this question. Believe so we're going to go to Darren. <laughs> yeah, believe me, if I was jumping up and down, you'd be, it would be turning up on the Richter scales around the globe. Um, okay, yeah, I, th- t- you know, I tell you the truth, to me, it's sort of a, a simple case of those albums that you, you tend to see reappear on the chart, Abbey Road, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts, Club Band, and, um, and the White Album, especially in the case of Abbey Road, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts, Club Band, those albums are iconic with a capital I. Uh, those are albums that people who are passive music fans, passive Beatles fans, will know and uh, can identify. They, you see the cover, they know, oh, that's the Beatles. Uh, what is that? Uh, Abbey Road, right? And I guess when you're going back to buy something in the back catalog, the most recognizable is what sells. And um, also, Something is to be said for the older albums because they're older. I mean, I, it sounds, and I'm serious when I say that. You take somebody like take a take a band like the Four Seasons. If an mm-hmm. oldie station plays a, a Four Seasons song today, I feel like it's going to almost always be December 1963. Oh, what a night! Or um, uh, what's uh, not? Um, Who loves you? Thank you. I had all of a sudden I had swearing to God stuck in my head, but that's solo Frankie Valley. It's almost like those will be the tunes that would represent the four seasons, not antiques like Sherry or Big mm. Dirt Girls Don't Cry. And I think it's a similar situation with 
the Beatles catalog, the Rolling Stones catalog, the Kinks, any veteran act that's around. I mean, look at the Who. I mean, if a Who album, not counting any compilations, is going to reappear on the charts, it's going to be the most identifiable titles like Tommy or Who's Next, not Magic Bus or the, whatever early album you want to think of. The Rolling Stones, it's going to be Sticky Fingers, Let It Bleed, perhaps Exile on Main Street. It's not going to be Aftermath or Between the Buttons. So I think it's just that these iconic acts have these uh, iconic albums that, you know, that that transcend music and that the masses can can identify and thus will, you know, if they're looking to buy a catalog album to go with their brand new Let It Be box set, it's Abbey Road or it's Sgt. Pepper. And but you can no also op- you can also argue the fact that the Beatles catalog is as iconic as it gets. And but we're talking from start to finish. It's not like the later stuff is the only stuff that's iconic. No, and, no, you're right. And you're talking about album covers. Yeah, I know Abbey Road is probably the most well-known album cover in rock, probably. It's certainly the most parody, that and Sgt. Pepper. But, you know, all the album covers the Beatles made, people can recognize. Well, here, let's look at this. Let's look at it this way. Because uh, we're talking strictly United States here when, you, when you're talking Billboard charts. Mm -hmm. Um, So here in the United States, please, please me with the Beatles, Beatles for sale, uh, the UK Hard Day's Night, the UK Help. It's almost as if those albums are brand new albums released in 1987. Okay, whereas the old tried and true favorites, probably led by Meet the Beatles, are no longer in stores because I do think the reissues have quietly drifted away. And if they haven't, there's very few, <laughs> there's very few stores. Uh, but when you're talking about new, new sealed CDs or LPs, I think those U.S. albums, those reissues have drifted away. You know, so uh, I think here in the United States still, and this may always be this way, the general buying public does not seize Please Please Me or With the Beatles or maybe uh, you know a better example might be Beatles for Sale and Please Please Me those albums for example they're not things to catch the eye and um, immediately resonate Sgt Pepper has from the minute it came out in 67 same and that was the first uh yeah well no it wasn't it wasn't the first album to Rubber Soul was that was sort of sort of left alone packaging wise but it's all what catches the eye in Sgt Pepper has been catching folks' eyes since 1967. Same with the White Album, same with Abbey Road. Not the case with Please Please Me or Beatles for Sale. Uh, and I think that plays into it. You and think I the album think covers? The, you think the album covers matter that much? Yeah, yeah. I think it's very important. It's the visual that people see. Okay. I don't think in this day and age, and this may not have been the case 30 years ago, but today, I don't think there were too many people out there looking to buy back catalogs of any artist and go, you know, I got to find that album that has fill in the blank, that Mm. song or this song, you know, you go on and, um, you know, I'm not to sound ignorant to, you know, digital purchasing and Spotify and all that, but you go and you're looking at little thumbnail photos and what's going to jump out at you. Sgt. Pepper, the white album. I would even say the white album would be third in that group. Definitely Abbey road, Sgt. Pepper one, two, and yet those do t- turn out more times than not. Even one, one, I never liked. I still don't like the album cover of one. Yet it jumps out at you, regardless of where it is. Computer screen, iPod screen, iPod, iPhone screen, anything. <laughs> uh, it jumps out. And somehow people now see that big yellow one on the red background. Think Beatles. One always seems to pop up along with the cattle, few catalog titles. I think it's what jumps off and catches people's fancy. And nobody's interested in digging around uh, to these other things and experiment and find out know, what's this. You know, it, go with what you know. That's unfortunately the way it is. And I think that's all there is to it. Hmm. So I, I would have thought that it had more to do with the music than the way it's packaged. You would like to, you would like to think it does. I ha- I feel it. Mm. You know, then they're going to go for a hits collection, and the hits collection that jumps out at you is one. Case closed. 
Well, ever since one was released, it has become the dark side of the moon of the Beatles catalog. It's always there on the charts. If there's ever any album that that will appear whenever there's any resurgence in the Beatles, it's Mm -hmm. always the Beatles one. I've always felt this. I mean, people are going to go and they're going to run and they want the hits. They're looking for this. song. I love that. Oh, I love that song. One. You know, they're not thinking, no, let me look a little further. Let me. Oh, that's on this. Please, please me album. And uh, oh, look at that. There's something on Beatles for sale. Let me get the. Unfortunately, the buying public does not think like that anymore. We still do, because I think that way of thinking, buying music and whatnot, was what was happening 20, even more than that, 30, 40 years ago when we were younger. And you went looking at the back of album covers to get certain songs and, you know, and things were newer. Now it's like, and it had, it's not just the Beatles. There were so many other acts, hits, compilations, playlists, you know, or what people are gravitating to. Mm. Belton John was able to f- pick up and resume his tour, which hopefully he will, his farewell tour. People are going to be grabbing at the hits collections and not buying Caribou and, uh, you know, Tumbleweed Connection. That's sad. No, I've noticed that because if you look at the, the album charts, especially with classic rock artists, the albums that stay on the charts or reappear are always the greatest hits ones. I mean, the biggest one, example with that particular point you just made, which is sad, is Bob Marley and the Wailers. It's always legend. Mm. Legend, the greatest hits album, folks. Don't you want to dig a little deeper and listen to Catch a Fire or Burning or Exodus? Uh, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, enough, it, 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 they'll, it, people will run to legend. And I think that's what happens in this case, specifically with the Beatles. You identify with Abbey Road. Everyone knows the Abbey Road cover. Everyone knows Sgt. Pepper. I think almost everyone knows the White Album. And I would think Rubber Soul and Revolver a lot know it. Not everyone. And that's the catalog titles that then reappear, you know, when there's a reason to go back and buy older Beatle music. Mm. Okay. We'll talk about the music in just a bit. But, Alan, do you agree with anything that Darren just said about the the packaging? No, he's an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) No, I I, I agree with a lot of of, of, uh, he made a lot of good points, I thought. Um, But while I was listening, it it sort of occurred to me that in, in a way we're asking a very strange question as if it is not a very strange question. I mean, if you look at, say, help a rubber soul what you're asking is why in 2021 are these 1965 albums not on the charts and and maybe the the better question is why after all this time are sergeant pepper abbey road and the white album on the charts like why are the are they on you know this is a long time in the future from these albums and and i don't think there is an expectation when an album comes out that it's going to be on the chart for 40, 50 years. And, you know, I mean, maybe dark side of the moon has been, <laughs> but, um, you know, but, but that's the fluke. I, I'm not sure that we should expect all these albums to be on the chart. I mean, I say that even, you know, knowing for certain that all these albums together are the zenith of Western civilization, as I always say. And, yeah, there's a part of me that thinks like, well, what's what's the point of there being other things on the chart anyway? But you know, realistically, the covers. Yeah, I'm not sure that you know people don't see Meet the Beatles and say, well, you know, I'm not going to get with the Beatles. You know, it's almost the same. A lot of it is the same album. And oh, in that case, yeah, because the photo jumps out at you. Yeah, and I'm, you know. And you see with the Beatles and you probably buy if there's a person looking to buy uh, and think they're getting meet the Beatles. That maybe is a little bit of an exception because it's so similar. Yeah. But, you know, but it's not on you, Ken's list of, of the ones that are on the chart. So, yeah, well, I think that also has to do with age. I mean, it's just yeah. like I said, with four seasons and oldie stations now going to play. Oh, what a night. And yet. You know, something like, uh, oh, there's so many great songs from the early 60s that are now almost ready to go into the classical music category. Mm-hmm. I think that is also part of it. Yeah. You know, well, look at the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones go on tour, put out a new album, and people want to go get some some things for their collection. 
it's going to be sticky fingers. It's going to be let it bleed. Yeah. It's not going to be Rolling Stones now. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. in the in the Stones case, it, it's also that, you know, apart from Satisfaction and a few older things, like those older albums, like Off the Hook is not in their touring set now, you know, or it has been, hasn't been for a very long time. And so those very early Stones albums, apart from the hits on them, you know, aren't necessarily things people coming to the Stones this late in the game are going to hear them play if they go see them. Um, with the Beatles, that's not an issue, really, except for Paul plays a lot of old Beatles things. But, you know, when when Ken brought up the topic um, a few weeks ago, and, you know, I think we've all been thinking about it since, um, I had understood it in a completely different way, partly because of debates that I've had with other people, like, for instance, Mark Lewison. You know, Mark always, I think I might have made a comment about, you know, the, the late Beatles or, you know, whatever from Rubber Soul on, um, which is where I see the dividing line. And he was saying, you know, there's no reason people should look down their noses at, you know, the albums before that either. And of course, he's right. There is no reason people should look down their noses at them. But if you put on Please Please Me and With the Beatles... I mean, we love the stuff, but put yourself in the place of a younger listener now. Those are pretty datey albums. You know, the technology that they were recorded on is pretty antique. The way they were made is is very old school. And I kind of think that there may be something in that sound. It continues to appeal to us, but it doesn't appeal to younger listeners quite as much. Hard Day's Night, I don't know why that is not a classic along with, you know, their later albums, because it's, a, mm -hmm. it's their first album that's all original stuff. It's song for song. It's just an incredible album. It is a bright explosion in 1964. Beatles for Sale, we've talked about why why a lot of people don't like that one for for you know various reasons help uh you know here we may be getting into part of what Darren is saying about the US versus the UK one but for crying out loud the UK one is all Beatles material and the US one has the uh soundtrack music the orchestral scoring um I don't mean to cut in here though Alan but do you really think today in 2021 um Joe regular who's Buying music is 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 really thinking it through this much. You um, know what I'm saying, yeah. I mean, all I'm saying is that if you go into a store and you were to see the U.S. and U.K. ones and flip them over and see what the track lists are, you know, why wouldn't you buy the U.K. one, which is 14 Beatles tracks, as opposed to just the film songs with Ken Thorne's score, you know. But, you know, the majority of people that buy music, whether we want to admit this or not, are a younger demographic. Right. That's what I'm saying. And, and I don't think it would matter one iota whether you've got the British version of help or the American version of help. That's not going to be right. a deciding no. factor as, as to uh, what someone's going to buy. Right. Uh, in that particular case, I was really only referring to Darren's comment about the American album covers that we all grew up with and why mm. it might not be. I think that those early albums, just for young listeners, just sound a little too antique. You know, they may not sound it to us because we grew up with them and, you know, they're they're in our blood. But, you know, to tell you the truth, Please Please Me sounds pretty antique to me now. You know, that's... that's. It just, I, mean, I was just going to say that. I was listening to it recently going, oh, no, I am officially getting old because it sounds, <laughs> it sounds old to me. And, that's so, and, and not so much with the Beatles, but Please Please Me does. Yeah. Whereas Pepper and Abbey Road and, and the White Album, to some degree, are much spiffier sounding. You know, there's a lot more overdubbing. There are effects. There's there's stuff that people now are used to and expect. But still, you know, again, in terms of the, you know, musically, I always saw the dividing line at Rubber Soul. You know, I mean, there's great stuff on Yesterday and all the earlier ones, but Rubber Soul seems to be where the dividing line is. So it surprised me, uh, you know, when 
Ken was saying, well, really, it's 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 Pepper, the White Album, and Abbey Road, because I was thinking it's, you know, everything after Rubber Soul gets much more respect. And I guess it gets much more respect. It just doesn't get on the charts. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, so well, I wasn't looking at it from a chart perspective. I was just looking at it as, you know, the material itself. Well, I will now tell you that when we did this show in my Fab Forum days, and I got emails about this, the main reason why my listeners then felt that those earlier albums weren't on the charts was because they said that they sound dated. Hmm. So it's interesting that you you both have brought that up here because, you know, you could take a song like She Loves You. There's no way on earth you're ever going to convince me if I heard that song right now for the first time that that's a contemporary song. Right. In terms of the way that it's written, you know, and um, production wise, I still think, you know, all the Beatles music was wonderfully produced and a lot of their early stuff from me to you sounds dated to me. Um, but I also want you to know being dated doesn't bother me in the slightest. <laughs> it's not in any way going to affect whether or not I still love the music. Right. It's not, it's not the main criteria as to why I listen to something. I could listen to a fifties rock and roll song and know it's from the fifties and still love it. I can listen to an eighties song with eighties production and still love it. If people, some people think that sounds very dated. It has no bearing as to whether or not I still love the music, but it does matter to a lot of people. And, um, you know, a lot of the stuff, especially the, um, the girl group sounding songs are influenced by girl groups and the, the call and answer stuff, you know, that does sound like it's from another era. I mean, one of my favorite Beatles songs is You're Gonna Lose That Girl. And that definitely has that influence, that girl group sound, you know, calling and answering back and forth in the group. But it does have a dated sound. It's produced extremely well, but it does sound dated. And I think that that's part of the reason why those albums are not on the charts and haven't been. And, and you know, it doesn't bother me at all that the later stuff outsells the earlier stuff. It's just that you don't see the earlier stuff at all on the charts. So... And, uh, you know, it's still a learning experience going from one album to the next and seeing how much this group evolved and grew so rapidly. And it's a fascinating thing to watch. But one other thing I want to bring up here is, well, you know, Darren and I have been in radio a long time. We know what radio plays. You were just bringing up the Four Seasons hits. You know that over time, because radio stations we're talking terrestrial radio. They want to appeal to a certain demographic. And once that demographic gets older, they phase them out, which means that you have to move the music up to later decades. So an oldie station now or a classic hit station, if they play 70s on up, you're not going to hear the early Four Seasons hits. You're going to hear those 70s, 70s hits like December 1963. But in classic rock, for the longest time, their starting point has been 1967. 1967 was such an, an incredible year and a, an important year in rock with Sgt. Pepper and Jimi Hendrix and The Doors. And it was really the start of album rock, albums getting accepted more as an art form. Do you think that that has anything to do with there being this dividing line? I know it. You know, you were saying, Alan, you think it starts with Rubber Soul with the Beatles. But, you know, you think that was a factor in any way in the way that people hear the music now from years of influence of listening on the radio and not really hearing the pre-1967 music as much. It's one thing to hear it on a Beatles show, a weekly Beatles show, where you're going to have a mix of all of it. But I'm talking about what you normally would hear all these years on the radio in classic rock, you rarely hear anything before 1967. Mm. So that becomes a, a self-fulfilling, you know, mode of being in a way. I mean, if, 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 if only stuff from 67 on is being played on the radio and people are being introduced to it, even if they're listening to a you know, classic rock format, then they're just not going to have a hankering to go out and get the hard day, British Hard Day's Night, you know? 
Right. Yeah, if you're not exposed to it, if new audiences are not exposed to it, they're not going to have an interest in it. Do you the think this has been an said, influence? Yeah, Darren? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, the, the way radio treats uh, older material also feeds into this. That's an excellent point. You put on a classic rock station, the likelihood of hearing A Hard Day's Night uh, is small. The likelihood of hearing Hey Jude is great. You know, and then there's the reverse of that. Put on a classic station and you will hear Band on the Run. You will not hear anything from McCartney 3. And other artists, it's the same thing. I mean, I mean, old, older fans, did you know Kansas and Blue Oyster Cult put out new albums in 2020? No, nope. because the classic rock stations are stuck at a certain point. You won't find the new Blue Oyster Cult or Kansas album on charts, but you will find Kansas Greatest Hits, the best of Kansas. You know what I'm saying? It's the mm -hmm. same revert. It's a reverse thing there. Uh, how come the new albums aren't charting? Why didn't the new Blue Oyster Cult album charting? Well, because they're still playing you know, Don't Fear the Reaper. So <laughs> the essential is what's popping up. Mm -hmm. And reverse that to our topic. We're talking, you know, the opposite of that. The older stuff getting neglected. Uh, but that is an excellent point. The classic stations that will play the Beatles the most aren't going past 1967 or 66 anymore. Yeah, and I find that really sad. You know, but that's reality of how radio has been. And it's it's been this way for decades, you know, and I've been talking a lot about the new releases of veteran artists like McCartney and the fact that their new releases, if they chart at all, are on the charts for a month like McCartney three just was. And you have to feel lucky that it debuted at number two. And I guess in that respect, it's looked upon as being a success. But because radio the people who program radio feel that the only people who would care enough about a new album from a veteran artist would have to be in an age group that they don't want to appeal to, then they're not going to play the new music from a veteran artist. Or if they do, it's only done for a very short period of time out of respect, and that's it. You know, something else I was thinking about, in 1973, we had two very important compilations, 1962 to 66, and 1967 to 1970. And sometimes I wonder if that is in any way an influence here, because they made it a dividing line there. And it makes sense when, if you're going back to 62, you make each one four years. But I noticed that in 1973, 1967 to 1970 did better on the charts than hmm. 62 to 66, even back then. So... You know, this is something that's been going on for a, for a long time, but certainly ever since the CDs have come out. Do you think that the music of 67 on is necessarily better or just more interesting or production wise? Well, you were talking about this before, uh, Alan. You know, maybe I should bring this up because Sgt. Pepper is a case in point where for so long I've heard people say to me, that's an album of its time now. It's an album that screams 1967. So if that was the case, why should that album still do fairly well on the charts? Hmm. Alan? Uh, I think that it is, its appeal is, you know, in all of its elements, including the cover, including the production, including the sound effects, including the, you know, sophistication of the songs on it. I mean, if you say, are, are the later things necessarily better than the early things? Um, you know, I guess it depends what criteria you use. But, you know, I don't think there's any doubt that by 1967, John and Paul, as songwriters, were immensely more mature than they were only, you know, four or five years earlier. You know, on... Please Please Me and with the Beatles, you know, they have their own style. It's very recognizably Beatley, but they're still pretty much playing off the models of their heroes. And on both those albums, they still have cover versions of the things that they were listening to, uh, which, which makes those albums different anyway. Um, because I think that the Beatles appeal to a lot of the public at this point is 
as creators of music, not as interpreters of music. You know, they do a great role over Beethoven, but I'm not sure, you know, people care about that so much as the Lennon McCartney and Harrison and the couple of star songs. And so those two albums automatically seem, you know, okay, it's diluted. It's not all Beatles originals and the same with Beatles for Sale. But that still is an answer why, you know, I mean, in, in terms of technology and in terms of sophistication, Rubber Soul and Revolver have an awful lot going for them, too. Uh, so I can't yeah. say why those don't ever chart, you know, especially given that Revolver, as you say, comes up in all of these surveys as the Beatles' greatest album. You would think that it would would have a better chart showing. But Pepper, you know, there's just something really magical about Pepper, you know, and like I say, it's to do with every part of the package. I just think there's something about all of that, you know, I mean, the cover sort of screams complexity to you in a way. It isn't necessarily meant to, but it's not just the group standing there. It's two of the groups standing there, plus a gazillion other people, plus all the flowers, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's mesmerizing. So, hmm. I mean, I, I can see why that is a good, you know, something that even if you didn't grow up in the Beatle era, you know, you look at that and there's, you know, quite obviously something special about that album, not to mention its reputation, you know, that you'd have heard of before you ever played it at this point, too. So. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not so much why aren't people gravitating to uh, older albums like Help, a Hard Day's Night, it speaks volumes to the stature of Sgt. Pepper and Abbey Road. You know, um, I mean, it's more, I, I think it's also the, I, I throw this word around again, the iconic nature of Abbey Road, Sgt. Pepper, uh, those two albums that <laughs> the others don't have a chance, uh, <laughs> as good as they are. To make the argument, and it would be a prop, it would be a good argument, the Beatles never made a bad album. Uh, that the weakest albums, if you think it's Beatles for Sale or even Let It Be, there are bands that would kill to have those as their best albums. <laughs> That's right. You know, but the 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 stratosphere that Sgt. Pepper and Abbey Road are in, the other albums don't stand a chance. They're more than just albums. They're like, uh, you know, uh, part experiences. Of pop culture. <laughs> I mean, look at Pink Floyd. Uh, I think Wish You Were Here in many ways is as good as The Dark Side of the Moon. But you tell somebody, go buy an older Pink Floyd album, every time out, Dark Side of the Moon will sell more than Wish You Were Here. Maybe not much, but I Wish You Were Here doesn't have a chance when it's going up against the Dark Side of the Moon or the Wall. Yet Wish You Were Here is probably better than the Wall and might be as good as the Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, Revolver might be, uh, listen, pound for pound, songwriting skill-wise, I think A Hard Day's Night's a better album than Sgt. Pepper. If you're looking at songs, hmm. break them apart as songs. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, for example, look how many great songs are on. If you don't want to use A Hard Day's Night as an example, let's go with Rubber Soul. How many great songs are on Rubber Soul yet? If you look at Sgt. Pepper and you, would you, you know, being for the benefit of the Mystic, Mr. Kite's great, but it's not as good as the stuff that's on Rubber Soul or A Hard Day's Night. Hmm. Well, everyone has a different opinion, but I have run across a lot of people now who will say to me that they don't listen to Sgt. Pepper as much as many other Beatle albums. They're more likely to listen to Revolver or the White Album or Abbey Road than Sgt. Pepper or Rubber Soul. A lot of people I've found in the last few decades have had much more uh, respect for the middle period of Rubber Soul Revolver, and yet you don't see that on the charts. But then, you know, to me, as someone who's always said it's the music that matters the most, more so than the packaging, you know, if I was a teenager right now and somebody played to me a song from Revolver and then played a song from Sgt. Pepper, it's not like I would automatically say, hey, you know, Sgt. Pepper just blows it out of the water. You know, if I heard Tomorrow Never Knows <laughs> right now, I'd be quite impressed with it. You know, mm -hmm. it's... um. No one can say that all the Beatles albums are equally great. But I think those of us who have studied all the Beatles albums would say that they are all great. <laughs> so all these albums deserve to have attention. And it just, um, 
it's like I said, if I could see Rubber Soul at the bottom of the top 200 once, I'd be happy. But mm-hmm. I don't even see that. You know, I haven't looked at the charts. I, I, was a, I grew up loving Billboard and loving the charts, and they don't interest me in the least now. Mm-hmm. In fact, I was stunned when I was looking to see how McCartney 3 was doing, looking at the top 100 at around mm-hmm. Christmas time and seeing all these Christmas greatest hits albums that were charting so high. Once upon a time, Christmas albums sometimes didn't even show up on the charts. Right. You know, because they didn't sell a lot because it was a seasonal release. And by the time the sales were recorded, Christmas was over. Uh, and maybe even stores weren't reporting the Christmas albums in January, you know, you know mm-hmm. before SoundScan. But I'm looking at the charts in, 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 in December 2020, and I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. Dandy Williams' Greatest Hits is a top 10 album? <laughs> but you that's know, a great uh, thing. Orion that tells, that Christmas. shows you it's more accurate that way. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's such a completely different playing field, though, today. It's almost hard. You could have these debates and go round and round in circles. We are all cut from a cloth, a different cloth. And, uh, you know, people, uh, I, I, I go back to Pink Floyd as an example, maybe repeating what I just said. You know, back catalog, the wall shows up, not animals. A lot of Pink Floyd fans, I think, would say animals is a better album than the wall. The wall, like Sgt. Pepper, is the complete package. It's the visuals. It's, in the case of the wall, it's the concept. It's the story. Break the wall into pieces. And there's there's a number of tunes that would fall into the filler category. Mm. Not that anything on Sgt. Pepper does. But if you put fixing a hole up against anything on Revolver, I think everyone would say fixing a hole is going to ha- be lucky that, you know, it gets any attention. Yeah, I got well, off a tangent there, but. Let me just say, and I know I'll get some heat for saying this, and there's a lot of bands that i like out there and solo artists that i like out there but to me there's the beatles and there's everybody else the beatles are in a totally different class altogether because all their albums really were superb and it is fascinating to see as i said their growth from album to album you know i wouldn't say that about all the other bands i mean everyone has their favorites so uh but that's just how i feel when it comes to the beatles i think every one of their albums deserves attention Obviously, some more than others, but I think they all deserve attention. So, I really think there is no definitive to this question. It's a why. There's a bunch of things that we said. Probably most of the things we said all rolled into one or the reason why. All right. And uh, I agree with you there, Darren. And I think this is a fascinating topic. And I would love to know what you guys listening think about this, especially if you're a younger fan how you view the Beatles catalog. Do you agree with some of the things that we said about maybe their earlier stuff is kind of dated uh, when you listen to music today and compare, compare that to any of the music that's uh, of your, your favorite artists of today and you mix it together. Do you feel the later stuff mixes well? I'd love to know what your thoughts are about this. And uh, Alan is always so good at giving all of our contact information. So I, why don't I pass you over to him? Okay, you can write to us uh, by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. That's one word things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Um, we're also we also have a Twitter feed um, at things we said fab. We have a Facebook page or two uh, things we said today, but we think of the main one as things we said today Beatles radio fans. Um, you know, the show will be posted there. You can, you can comment under that or on the YouTube version, or I think even the Podbean version has, uh, comments too. Feel free to let us know what you think. And if you can, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yeah. Okay. And as far as people wanting to contact you, Alan? Okay. Uh, apart from those ways, uh, the easiest way is just through Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Okay. Darren, how about you? Well, first up, if you want to listen to me on WFUV uh, and you're in the New York City metropolitan area, we're at 90.7 FM and also 90.7 FM HD2. I'm on the air Mondays through Thursdays right now from 10 p.m. to midnight. Hopefully when the pandemic is over and we're operating 100% 
we're operating uh, normal because <laughs> we're all broadcasting from our home studios right now with the pandemic. Um, the show uh, will uh, go back to being 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. But right now it's just 10 p.m. to midnight, Monday through Thursday and Saturday afternoons, 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, that's when you can hear me on FUV. And if you're outside the New York City area, uh, anywhere in the world, for that matter, you can stream us at WFUV.org or download the WFUV app and listen there. As for contacting me directly, I have two Facebook pages. If you were to send me a friend request, I'll probably ask you, how do I know you? Uh, which is what I do with everyone. And you just say, hey, I listen to the podcast. I'll send you an invitation to like my other page as well. Or if you find it, just like the other page. Uh, which uh, has my name in it, or just two Facebook pages. Just search for me. Uh, and if you want to email me, uh, go to uh, send me an email at Darren DeVivo, D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O at W-F-U-V dot org. Okay, very good, Darren. As for me, if you would like to contact me directly, my email address is everylittlething at A-T-T dot net. I want to mention just a few things going on with my website. I have a special contest, which is starting on Thursday, February 4th, to win the brand new CD by Barry Gibb and Friends. Barry Gibb, of course, of the Bee Gees. Uh, This is called Greenfields, the Gibb Brothers Songbook, Volume 1. And what Barry has done is he has collaborated and he's recorded duets with people in the country music field, mainly contemporary ones. A few veterans like Dolly Parton and uh, Olivia Newton-John, but certain people like Keith Urban, Little Big Town, Alison Krauss. There's a whole bunch of really great people on this new album, all covering Bee Gees classics. And you can win a copy on CD. I have three copies to give away in a special contest that will run for a full week starting on February 4th. You can find out all the details on my homepage, which will lead you to my special contest page at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Also on my Beatles Trivia and Games page, where you can win one of ten Beatle prizes every week for, well, maybe in the next two weeks. Someone's going to win one of the ten prizes, and if they want, they can win the Barry Gibbs CD as well. You just have to let me know that you want it. That's all. So uh, if you can, check out my Beatles Trivia and Games page. And uh, I'm now giving away McCartney 3 on CD and the new book by Jerry Hammock called The Beatles Recording Reference Manual, Volume 5, From Let It Be to Abbey Road. That's all part of the 10 prizes on my uh, trivia page there. I do have a YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio. I have been experiencing some technical problems with it. I'm hoping to get that resolved very soon. And when that's done, you'll be seeing some new interviews, including one with Al Sussman on there. And the next Talk More Talk, which is on Monday night, that'll be February the 8th. That's at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. You can join us on our Facebook page. All of the co-hosts will be talking about our top three favorite songs that the Beatles covered in their solo careers. So your top three favorite Paul McCartney songs that he covered, not original stuff, him covering other people's material. Top three George songs, top three John songs, top three Ringo songs. We'll have some fun with that next Monday night. Go to the Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, and catch us as we're doing it live and write to us as we're doing the show. And then after that, it's going to be on all kinds of platforms including our YouTube page. And if you can, please subscribe to that, as well as my own YouTube page, Ken Michaels Radio. All right, this has been a great conversation. It's something that I wanted to do 10 years ago. You never know if this pattern continues. 10 years from now, I might do it again. <laughs> but uh, that's if my, my co-hosts want to do it. We yeah, have. Why not? We'll see, see what's getting on the charts then. Okay. Be funny if it's only the early stuff. Yeah. Be a complete reversal. Anyway, for Darren DeVivo and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michael saying thanks to all of you for joining us, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.